All right, this is gonna be a long one, so I thank you in advance for your patience. Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm gonna be doing a quick review of Agatha Christie, an autobiography. And I read this as a buddy read with books like Woe, so I definitely encourage you to check out her channel if you're in any way interested in Agatha Christie, because for example, she's recently been doing her Project Poirot videos. She's all about the Agatha. So actually, it was good because we both kind of encouraged each other to read this one. We both knew that the other person had it on our TBRs. And so we just kind of said, you know, let's let's finally do it, let's finally do it, and so we did. So I'm gonna read the blurb. Agatha Christie is known throughout the world as the queen of crime. She wrote over 100 novels, short story collections, and plays, and her books have sold over a billion copies in English and another billion in over 100 foreign languages. She has become, quite simply, the best-selling novelist in history. An autobiography, published in 1977, a year after her death, tells of her fascinating private life, from early childhood through two marriages and two world wars, and her experiences both as a writer and on archaeological expeditions with her second husband, Max Mallowan. Not only does the book reveal the true genius of her legendary success, but the story is vividly told and as captivating as one of her novels. So a few things that I want to highlight in general before I get stuck in. For a start, this is the 25th anniversary commemorative edition. I did think the print was just a tad small. If you look at that compared to the size of my finger. I know there are other editions though. So maybe just be careful if you're getting the paperback and you have poor eyesight because you're just not going to be able to read it. Another thing that I would say is that this doesn't actually really touch on the book so much. Like she'll mention the odd title here and there but you don't get to know too much about the circumstances behind her books. It's much more about her life, so you can kind of put the books in more context because you know where she was herself when she was writing it, but she doesn't explain where she got her you know, motivations or her ideas or anything like that really, except on a few different kind of occasions. But part of that is because she didn't actually really consider herself to be a writer. She considered herself first and foremost to be a housewife really. And it was only once she'd sold a dozen or so books and was starting to have to pay tax and stuff that she was like, oh, I'm actually going to have to take this seriously. We, we couldn't think of any booktubers apart from ourselves that would really be interested in reading this. I mean, it is a big, long book. I think it was, it was 560 pages with that tiny print. And unless you're a massive Agatha Christie fan or you, for some reason, just really like reading autobiographies, it's, it's not really going to make much sense for you to read it, you know. It is a very specialist appeal book. I did still enjoy it though. I'm going to go through anyway and pick out some of these tabs and see what I highlighted. My father was a simple-hearted Orthodox Christian. He said his prayers every night and went to church every Sunday. His religion was matter-of-fact and without heart searchings, but if my mother liked hers with trimmings, it was quite alright with him. He was, as I have said, an agreeable man. I think he was relieved when my mother returned to the Church of England in time for me to be christened in the parish church. I was called Mary after my grandmother, Clarissa after my mother, and Agatha as an afterthought, suggested on the way to the church by a friend of my mother's who said it was a nice name. I think, I, I quite like this, I think this line here is quite telling as well about how life has changed, so she said, One of the things I think I should miss most, if I were a child nowadays, would be the absence of servants. To a child they were the most colourful part of daily life. Nurses supplied platitudes, servants supplied drama, entertainment, and all kinds of unspecified but interesting knowledge. Far from being slaves, they were frequently tyrants. They knew their place, as was said, but knowing their place meant not subservience but pride, the pride of the professional. Servants in the early 1900s were highly skilled. Parlourmaids had to be tall, to look smart, to have been perfectly trained, to have the right voice in which to murmur, hock or sherry. They performed intricate miracles of valeting for the gentleman. I like this, she says that that in the battle of David versus Goliath, David was in a superior position from the start. She says, the man with a long distance weapon against the man who had none, not so much the little fellow against the big one as brains versus brawn. Also, this is quite interesting here. A good many interesting people came to our house during my young days, and it seems a pity that I do not remember any of them. All I recall about Henry James is my mother complaining that he always wanted a lump of sugar broken in two for his tea, and that it really was affectation, as a small knob would do quite as well. <laughs> Rudyard Kipling came, and again my only memory is a discussion between my mother and a friend as to why he had never married Mrs Kipling. There's a bit of talk about toilets as well, she says, we were very delicate about lavatories in those days. It was unthinkable to be seen entering or leaving one except by an intimate member of the family. Difficult in our house, since the lavatory was halfway up the stairs and in full view from the hall. The worst, of course, was to be inside and then hear voices below. Impossible to come out. 
One had to stay immured there until the coast was clear. She got a lot of wisdom as Agatha, so she says here, It is curious to look back over life, over all the varying incidents and scenes, such a multitude of odds and ends. Out of them all, what has mattered? What lies behind the selection that memory has made? What makes us choose the things that we have remembered? It is, it is as though one went to a great trunk full of junk in an attic and plunged one's hands into it and said, I will have this and this and this. She talks here as well, and it, it does kind of go to show how women of the time have been kind of brainwashed by society. So she says, When first the electric trams did run in all their scarlet glory, t'was well but ere the day was done, it was another story. She says, I was elated at seeing myself in print, but I cannot say that it led me to contemplate a literary career. In fact, I only contemplated one thing, a happy marriage. About that I had complete self-assurance, as all my friends did. We were conscious of all the happiness that awaited us. We looked forward to love, to being looked after, cherished and admired. And we intended to get our own way in the things which mattered to us, while at the same time putting our husband's life, career and success before us all, as was our proud duty. We didn't need pet pills or sedatives. We had belief and joy in life. We had our own personal disappointments, moments of unhappiness, but on the whole, life was fun. Perhaps it is fun for girls nowadays, but they certainly don't look as if it is. However, a timely thought. They may enjoy melancholy. Some people do. They may enjoy the emotional crises that seem always to be overwhelming them. They may even enjoy anxiety. That is certainly what we have nowadays, anxiety. My contemporaries were frequently badly off and couldn't have a quarter of the things they wanted. Why then did we have so much enjoyment? Was it some kind of sap rising in us that has ceased to rise now? Have we strangled or cut it off with education and, worse, anxiety over education? Anxiety as to what life holds for you? And bearing in mind this was published in 1977, which is the same year Star Wars came out. I don't know, it's a bit... It's still relevant, you know. Says here, she says, I don't think necessity is the mother of invention. Invention, in my opinion, arises directly from idleness, possibly also from laziness, to save oneself trouble. That is the big secret that has brought us down the ages, hundreds of thousands of years, from chipping flints to switching on the washing up machine. She talks about sunbathing, so she says, There was, of course, no such thing as sunbathing on the beach. Once you left the water, you got into your bathing machine. You were drawn up with the same suddenness from with which you had been let down, and finally emerged, blue in the face, shivering all over, with hands and cheeks dyed away to a state of numbness. This, I must say, never did me any harm, and I was as warm as toast again in about three quarters of an hour. And these bathing machines, by the way, it's my understanding that you sort of got into them and they allowed you to get change in there and then would like kind of walk down with you as you went into the water so that gentlemen couldn't see you in a state of undress. I'm going to read you this big long section here because this is all about kind of books and plays and other stuff like that. So she says, Our first Dickens was Nicholas Nickleby and my favourite character was the old gentleman who courted Mrs Nickleby by throwing vegetable marrows over the wall. Can this be one of the reasons why I made Hercule Poirot retire to grow vegetable marrows? Who can say? My favourite Dickens of all was Bleak House and still is. Occasionally we would try Thackeray for a change. We got through Vanity Fair all right, but we stuck on the Newcombs. We ought to like it, said my mother. Everyone says it is his best. My sister's favourite had been Esmond, but that too we found diffuse and difficult. Indeed, I had never been able to appreciate Thackeray as I should. For my own reading, the works of Alexandre Dumas in French now entrance me. The Three Musketeers, Twenty Years After, and best of all, The Count of Monte Cristo. My favourite was the first volume, Le Chateau d'If, I don't know, I can't pronounce French. But although the other five volumes occasionally had me slightly bewildered, the whole colourful pageant of the story was entrancing. I also had a romantic attachment to Maurice Hewlett, The Forest Lovers, The Queen's Affair, and Richard Ye and Ney. Very good historical novels they are too. Occasionally, my mother would have a sudden idea. I remember one day when I was picking up suitable windfalls from the apple tree, she arrived like a whirlwind from the house. Quickly, she said. We are going to Exeter. Going to Exeter, I said, surprised. Why? Because Sir Henry Irving is playing there, in Beckett. He may not live much longer, and you must see him. A great actor. We've just time to catch the train. I have booked a room at the hotel. We duly went to Exeter, and it was indeed a wonderful performance of Beckett, which I have never forgotten. <laughs> we have this moment where somebody asks Agatha Christie's mum for permission to, to propose to her. She, uh, and her mum says, I told him I was quite sure you were not in love with him, and that it was no good his going on with the idea. Oh, mother, I exclaimed indignantly. You didn't. Oh, there's a typo there. I spotted a typo. It's missing uh, the quotation marks. Mother looked at me in great surprise. Do you mean to say you did like him, she demanded. Would you have considered marrying him? No, of course not, I said. 
I didn't want to marry him at all, and I'm not in love with him, but I really do think, mother, that you might let me have my own proposals. There's an interesting bit here as well, about uh, motor, motor cars. So she says, Another of the delights of staying with the Ralston Patricks was that they had a motor car. I cannot tell you the excitement that this produced in 1909. It was Robin's pet delight and treasure, and the fact that it was temperamental and broke down constantly made his passion for it all the greater. I remember one day we made an excursion to Banbury. Starting out was rather like equipping an expedition to the North Pole. We took large furry rugs, extra scarves to wrap around the head, baskets of provisions and so on. Constance's brother, Bill, Robin and I made the expedition. We said a tender farewell to Constance. She kissed us all, urged us to be careful and said she would have plenty of hot soup and home comforts waiting for us if we returned. Banbury, I may say, was about 25 miles from where they lived, but it was treated as though it was Land's End. Hey Google, how far away is Banbury? 48.2 miles from here. This bit's very interesting as well. In the year 1911, something that I considered fantastic happened. I went up in an aeroplane. Aeroplanes, of course, were one of the chief subjects of surmise, disbelief, argument and all the rest of it. When I had been at school in Paris, we were taken one day to see Santos Dumont endeavour to get up off the ground in the Bois de Boulogne. As far as I remember, the aeroplane got up, flew a few yards, then crashed. All the same, we were impressed. Then there were the Wright brothers. We read about them eagerly. And I believe the Wright brothers were about five years before she flew, so she's kind of a pioneer there. Then of course we have some photographs, I'm not going to show all of them. But they do help to break the book up. Is that one here? Oh, here we go, here's one I did want to share. This is Agatha Christie as a child. Anyway, after this point, at some point she wrote her first book and somebody somebody read it, I think it was a friend of the family, uh, Eden Philpotts. He was at the height of his fame, his novels of Dartmoor were celebrated. And uh, he wrote back to her and said, some of these things that you have written are capital. You have a great feeling for dialogue. You should stick to gay natural dialogue. Try and cut all moralizations out of your novels. You are much too fond of them and nothing is more boring to read. Try and leave your characters alone so that they can speak for themselves instead of always rushing in to tell them what they ought to say or to explain to the reader what they mean by what they are saying. That is for the reader to judge for himself. You have two plots here rather than one, but that is a beginner's fault. You soon won't want to waste plots in such a spend-free way. I'm sending you a letter to my own literary agent, Hughes Massey. He will criticise this for you and tell you what chance it has of being accepted. I'm afraid it is not easy to get a first novel accepted, so you mustn't be disappointed. I should like to recommend you a course of reading which I think you will find helpful. Read De Quincey's Confessions of an Opium Eater. This will increase your vocabulary enormously. He used some very interesting words. Read The Story of My Life by Jeffries for descriptions and a feeling for nature. She says... I've forgotten now what the other books were. A collection of short stories I remember, one of which was called The Piri Pride, and was written around a teapot. There was also a volume of Ruskin, to which I took a violent dislike, and one or two others. Whether they did me good or not, I don't know. I certainly enjoyed De Quincey and also the short stories. She's talking about her scepticism towards mediums and psychics, so she says, I also got rather tired of Wilfred's descriptions of the mediums he knew. There were two girls in Portsmouth, and the things those girls saw you wouldn't believe. They could hardly ever go into a house without gasping, stretching, clutching their hearts, and being upset because there was a terrible spirit standing behind one of the company. The other day, said Wilfred, Mary, she's the elder of the two, she went into her house and up to the bathroom to wash her hands, and do you know she couldn't walk over the threshold? No, she absolutely couldn't. There were two figures there. One was holding a razor to the throat of the other. Would you believe it? I nearly said, no, I wouldn't, but controlled myself in time. That's very interesting, I said. Had anyone ever held a razor to the throat of somebody there? They must have, said Wilfred. I like that she was sceptic, even in an age where people weren't necessarily sceptical. She talks here about her love for trains as well, which is potentially kind of a, you know, foreshadowing writing murder on the Orient Express, really. Ships can still be romantic. As for trains, what can beat a train? Especially before the diesels and their smell arrived. A great puffing monster carrying you through gorges and valleys, by waterfalls, past snow mountains, alongside country roads with strange peasants in carts. Trains are wonderful, I still adore them. To travel by train is to see nature and human beings, towns and churches and rivers, in fact, to see life. I don't mean, to, I don't mean that I am not fascinated by the conquering of air by man, by his adventures into space, possessed of that one gift that other forms of life do not have, the sense of adventure, the unconquerable spirit, and with it courage, not merely the coverage of self-defense, which all animals have, but the courage to take your life into your hands and go out into the unknown. 
I am proud and excited to feel that all this has happened in my lifetime, and I would like to be able to look into the future to see the next steps. One feels they will follow quickly on one another now, with a snowballing effect. It's a shame she didn't get to see the internet. I wonder what she would have made of that. This book as well, obviously, she lived through the First and the Second World War, so we have, for example, here, just part five, war. England was at war. It had come. And I think it's just sort of touching to read about that from somebody who lived through it all. I'm just sharing with you guys some of the bits that I found the most interesting. So another bit is this bit here where she says, On the whole, it is not usually the novices who make mistakes in chemist shops. They are nervous and always asking advice. The worst cases of poisoning through mistakes arise with the reliable chemists who have worked for many years. They are so familiar with what they are doing, so able to do it without really thinking anymore, that the time does come when one day, preoccupied perhaps with some troubles of their own, they make a slip. This happened in the case of the grandchild of a friend of mine. The child was ill and the doctor came and wrote a prescription which was taken to the chemist to be made up. In due course, the dose was administered. That afternoon, the grandmother did not like the look of the child. She said to the nanny, I wonder whether there is anything wrong with that medicine. After a second dose, she was still more worried. I think there is something wrong, she said. She sent for the doctor. He took a look at the child, examined the medicine and took immediate action. Children tolerate opium and its preparations very badly. The chemist had blundered, had put in quite a serious overdose. He was terribly upset, poor man. He had worked for this particular firm for 14 years and was one of their most careful and trusted dispensers. It shows what can happen to anybody. When they moved to the metric formula, it was very difficult. And uh, she says, one of our doctors at the hospital never learned what containing 0.1 really meant and would say, now let me see, is this solution one in a hundred or one in a thousand? The great danger of the metric system is if, that if you go wrong, you go 10 times wrong. Which is interesting. And also very true. It's a good observation, I think. She says here, so she was, I guess she was working at this pharmacy. It was while I was working in the dispensary that I first conceived the idea of writing a detective story. The idea had remained in my mind since Madge's earlier challenge, and my present work seemed to offer a favourable opportunity. Unlike nursing, where there was always something to do, dispensing consisted of slack or busy periods. Sometimes I would be on duty alone in the afternoon with hardly anything to do but sit about. Having seen that the stock bottles were full and attended to, one was at liberty to do anything one pleased except leave the dispensary. I began considering what kind of a detective story I could write. Since I was surrounded by poisons, perhaps it was natural that death by poisoning should be the method I selected. I settled on one fact which seemed to me to have possibilities. I toyed with the idea, liked it and finally accepted it. Then I went on to the dramatis personae. Who should be poisoned? Who would poison him or her? When? Where? How? Why? And all the rest of it. It would have to be very much of an interme murder, owing to the particular way it was done. It would have to be all in the family, so to speak. There would naturally have to be a detective. At that date, I was so steeped in the Sherlock Holmes tradition. So I considered detectives, not like Sherlock Holmes, of course. I must invent one of my own, and he would also have a friend as a kind of butt or stooge. That would not be too difficult. I returned to thoughts of my other characters. Who was to be murdered? A husband could murder his wife. That seemed to be the most usual kind of murder. I could, of course, have a very unusual kind of murder for a very unusual motive, but that did not appeal to me artistically. The whole point of a good detective story was that it must be somebody obvious, but at the same time, for some reason, you would then find that it was not obvious, that he could not possibly have done it, though really, of course, he had done it. At that point, I got confused and went away and made up a couple of bottles of extra hypochlorous lotion so that I should be fairly free of work the next day. She says, why not make my detective a Belgian, I thought. There were all types of refugees. How about a refugee police officer? A retired police officer? Not too young a one. What a mistake I made there. The result is that my fictional detective must really be well over a hundred by now. Anyway, I settled on a Belgian detective. I allowed him slowly to grow into his part. He should have been an inspector so that he would have a certain knowledge of crime. He would be meticulous, very tidy, I thought to myself, as I cleared away a good many untidy odds and ends in my own bedroom. A tidy little man. I could see him as a tidy little man, always arranging things, liking things in pairs, liking things square instead of round. And he should be very brainy. He should have little grey cells of the mind. That was a good phrase. I must remember that. Yes, he would have little grey cells. He would have rather a grand name, one of those names that Sherlock Holmes and his family had. Who was it that his brother had been? Mycroft Holmes. How about calling my little man Hercules? He would be a small man. Hercules, a good name. His last name was more difficult. I don't know why I settled on the name Poirot. Whether it just came into my head or whether I saw it in some newspaper or written on something. Anyway, it came. It went well, not with Hercules, but Hercule. Hercule Poirot. 
that was all right. Settled, thank goodness. We have the end of the war as well. So she describes that like this. She says, one day at the business school where I took my courses, the teacher stopped the lesson, went out of the room and returned saying, everything ended for today. The war is over. It seemed unbelievable. There had been no real sign of this being likely to happen. Nothing to lead you to believe that it would be over for another six months or a year. The position in France never seemed to change. One won a few yards of territory or lost it. I went out in the streets quite dazed. There I came upon one of the most curious sights I had ever seen. Indeed, I still remember it, almost, I think, with a sense of fear. Everywhere there were women dancing in the street. English women are not given to dancing in public. It is a reaction more suitable to Paris and the French. But there they were, laughing, shouting, shuffling, leaping even, in a sort of wild orgy of pleasure, an almost brutal enjoyment. It was frightening. One felt that if there had been any Germans around, the women would have advanced upon them and torn them to pieces. Some of them, I suppose, were drunk, but all of them looked it. They reeled, lurched, and shouted. I got home to find Archie already home from his air ministry. Well, that's that, he said, in his usual calm and unemotional fashion. Unfortunately, Archie was a little bit of a penis, but hey-ho. We get some interesting insights here into Murder on the Links, uh, which I don't think I've read, actually. But she, but she says... The Bodley Head were pleased with Murder on the Links, but I had a slight row with them over the jacket they had designed for it. Apart from being in ugly colours, it was badly drawn and represented, as far as I could make out, a man in pyjamas on a golf slinks dying of an epileptic fit. Since the man who had been murdered had been fully dressed and stabbed with a dagger, I objected. A book jacket may have nothing to do with the plot, but if it does, it must at least not represent a false plot. There was a good deal of bad feeling over this, but I was really furious and it was agreed that in future I should see the jacket first and approve of it. I had already had one slight difference with the bodily head, and that was in the mysterious affair at Styles over the spelling of the word cocoa. For some strange reason, the house spelling of cocoa, meaning by that a cup of cocoa, was C-O-C-O, -C -O, which, as Euclid would have said, is absurd. I was sternly opposed by Miss House, the dragon presiding over all spelling in the bodily head books. Coco, she said, in their publications, was always spelt C-O-C-O. -C -O. It was the proper spelling and was a rule of the firm. I produced tins of cocoa and even dictionaries. They had no impression on her. Cocoa was the proper spelling, she said. It was not until many years later, when I was talking to Alan Lane, John Lane's nephew and begetter of Penguin Books, that I said, you know, I had terrible fights with Miss House over the spelling of cocoa. He grinned. I know, we had great trouble with her as she got older. She got very opinionated about certain things. She argued with authors and would never give way. Innumerable people wrote to me and said, I can't understand, Agatha, why you spelled Coco, C-O-C-O, -C -O, in your book. Of course, you were never a good speller. Most unfair. I was not a good speller. I am still not a good speller. But at any rate, I could spell Coco the proper way. What I was, though, was a weak character. It was my first book, and I thought they must know better than I did. I've had similar arguments with both cover designers and with my editor, Pam Harris, as well. So... It is just a part of life as an author, unfortunately. You have to fight for that. Also, Agatha Christie was one of the first British women to do some surfing. So she describes it here. She's in New Zealand. She says, We arrived in the early morning, got into our rooms at the hotel, and straight away, seeing out of the window the people surfing on the beach, we rushed down, hired our surfboards, and plunged into the sea. We were, of course, complete innocents. It was a bad day for surfing, one of the days when only the experts go in. But we, who had surfed in South Africa, thought we knew all about it. It is very different in Honolulu. Sorry, that's where they are, in Hawaii. Your board, for instance, is a great slab of wood, almost too heavy to lift. You lie on it and slowly paddle yourself out towards the reef, which is, or seem to me, about a mile away. Then, when you have finally got there, you arrange yourself in position and wait for the proper kind of wave to come and shoot you through the sea to the shore. This is not so easy as it looks. Firstly, you have to recognise the proper wave when it comes, and secondly, even more important, you have to know the wrong wave when it comes, because if that catches you and forces you down to the bottom, heaven help you. She talks about when Archie got some really bad nettle rash and got like a fever and everything and she had to look after him. So this is what happens. So there we were, Archie and I at Montreal. Our roads were to part. Archie to go with Belcher and inspect Silver Fox Farms. I had to take a train south to New York. My money had by now completely run out. Archie didn't treat her that well, really. And then he cheated on her as well. And she had a mental breakdown. Oh, and then she gets a car of her own. And it's really quite sweet how she reacts to it. So she says, It was possible I, Agatha, could have a car. A car of my own. I will confess here and now that of the two things that have excited me most in my life, the first was my car. The grey, bottle-nosed Morris Cowley. The second was dining with the Queen at Buckingham Palace about 40 years later. 
Both of those happenings you see had something of a fairy tale quality about them. They were things that I never thought could happen to me, to have a car of my own and to dine with the Queen of England. You can get a car pretty easy now, but Queenie is still pretty unapproachable. This here as well, which is quite interesting, she talks about how you should never talk about your novel until after you finish writing it because people kind of taint your perception of it. So she says, um, I learned in the end never to say anything about a book before it was written. Criticism after you have written it is helpful. You can argue the point or you can give in, but at least you know how it has struck one reader. Your own description of what you are going to write, however, sounds so futile that to be told kindly that it won't do meets with your instant agreement. Some more stuff here that I found quite interesting. She said, The only thing I will advance as criticism is the fact that the would-be writer has not taken any account of the market for his wares. It is no good writing a novel of 30,000 words. That is not a length which is easily publishable at present. Oh, replies the author, but this book has got to be that length. Well, that is probably all right if you are a genius, but you are more likely to be a tradesman. You have got something you feel you can do well and that you enjoy doing well, and you want to sell it well. If so, you must give it the dimensions and the appearance that are wanted. If you were a carpenter, it would be no good making a chair, the seat of which was five feet up from the floor. It wouldn't be what anyone wanted to sit on. It is no good saying that you think the chair looks handsome that way. If you want to write a book, study what sizes books are, and write within the limits of that size. If you want to write a certain type of short story for a certain type of magazine, you have to make it the length, and it has to be the type of story that is printed in that magazine. If you like to write for yourself only, that is a different matter. You can make it any length, and write in any way you wish, but then you will probably have to be content with the pleasure alone of having written it. It's no good starting out by thinking one is a heaven-born genius. Some people are, but very few. No, one is a tradesman, a tradesman in a good honest trade. You must learn the technical skills and then, within that trade, you can apply your own creative ideas, but you must submit to the discipline of form. See, she is actually an expert writer, even though it took her a while to accept that. We talk about when she first tried working with dictation as well, which I think she did increasingly in her later years, but when she first ever tried to dictate a novel, she says, so the period of Halcyon days began. As soon as Rosalind started school, I began to prepare to start dictating a story. I was so nervous about it that I put it off from day to day. Finally, the time came. Charlotte and I sat down opposite each other, she with her notebook and pencil. I stared unhappily at the mantelpiece and began uttering a few tentative sentences. They sounded dreadful. I could not say more than a word without hesitating and stopping. Nothing I said sounded natural. We persisted for an hour. Long afterwards, Carlo told me that she herself had been dreading the moment when literary work should begin. Although she had taken a shorthand typing course, she had never had much practice in it, and indeed had tried to refresh her skills by taking down sermons. She was terrified that I would rush along at a terrific pace, but nobody could have found any difficulty in taking down what I was saying. That could have been written in longhand. We see here as well her sort of descent into when, when she didn't do too well. Because Archie was being a bit of a dickhead. She says, A terrible sense of loneliness was coming over me. I don't think I realised that for the first time in my life I was really ill. I had always been extremely strong, and I had no understanding of how unhappiness, worry and overwork could affect your physical health. But I was upset one day when I was just about to sign a cheque, and could not remember the name to sign it with. I felt like Alice in Wonderland touching the tree. But of course, I said. I know my name perfectly well, but what is it? I sat there with a pen in my hand, feeling an extraordinary frustration. What initial did it begin with? Was it perhaps Blanche Amory? It sounded familiar. Then I remembered that was some lesser character in Pendennis, a book I hadn't read for years. I had another warning a day or two later. I went to start the car, which usually had to be started with a starting handle. In fact, I am not sure that cars did not always have to be started with a handle in those days. I cranked and cranked and nothing happened. Finally, I burst into tears, came into the house and lay on the sofa sobbing. That worried me, crying just because a car wouldn't start. I must be crazy. Many years later, someone going through a period of unhappiness said to me, You know, I don't know what is the matter with me. I cry for nothing at all. The other day the laundry didn't come and I cried. And the next day the car wouldn't start. Something stirred in me then and I said, I think you'd better be very careful. It is probably the beginning of a nervous breakdown. You ought to go and see someone about it. I had no such knowledge in those days. I knew I was desperately tired and that the sorrow of losing my mother was still there deep down, though I tried, perhaps too much, to put it out of my mind. If only Archie would come, or Punky, or someone to be with me. She talks here about her daughter, Rosalind, as well. She was trying to write a book, and Rosalind kept getting in the way. And she says, Look here, Rosalind, I said. You must not interrupt. I've got some work to do. I've got to write another book. Carlo and I are going to be busy for the next hour with that. You must not interrupt. Oh, all right, said Rosalind gloomily, and went away. I looked at Carlo, sitting there with pencil poised, and I thought and thought and thought, cudgelling my brain. Finally, hesitantly, I began. After a few minutes, I noticed that Rosalind was just across the path, standing there, looking at us. 
What is it, Rosalind? I asked. What do you want? Is it half an hour yet? She said. No, it isn't. It's exactly nine minutes. Go away. Oh, all right. And she departed. I resumed my hesitant dictation. That would have done my head in. We have some more images here. Here we go. Here she is with Archie with their surfboards in Honolulu. I mean, how badass is that? That's in like 1910 or something. Oh, and she does a lot of traveling, so she says here. Here we come to fate again. Two days before I was to leave, I went out to dinner with friends in London. They were not people I knew well, but they were a charming couple. There was a young couple there, a naval officer, Commander Howe and his wife. I sat next to the commander at dinner, and he talked to me about Baghdad. He had just come back from that part of the world since he had been stationed in the Persian Gulf. After dinner, his wife came by and sat by me and we talked. She said people always said Baghdad was a horrible city, but she and her husband had been entranced by it. They talked about it and I became more and more enthusiastic. I said I suppose one had to go by sea. You can go by train, by the Orient Express. The Orient Express? All my life I had wanted to go on the Orient Express. When I had travelled to France or Spain or Italy, the Orient Express had often been standing at Calais and I had longed to climb up into it. Simplon Orient Express, Milan, Belgrade, Stamboul. She talks about what she can and can't do and what she likes and doesn't like. I was never good at games. I am not and never shall be a good conversationalist. I'm so easily suggestible that I have to get away by myself before I know what I really think or need to do. I can't draw. I can't paint. I can't model or do any kind of sculpture. I can't hurry without getting rattled. I can't say what I mean easily. I can write it better. I can stand fast on a matter of principle, but not on anything else. Although I know tomorrow is Tuesday, if somebody tells me more than four times that tomorrow is Wednesday, after the fourth time I shall accept that it is Wednesday and act accordingly. What can I do? Well, I can write. I could be a reasonable musician, but not a professional one. I am a good accompanist to singers. I can improvise things when in difficulties. This has been a most useful accomplishment. The things I can do with hairpins and safety pins when in domestic difficulties would surprise you. It was I who fashioned bread into a sticky pill, stuck it on a hairpin, attached the hairpin with sealing wax on the end of a window pole, and managed to pick up my mother's false teeth from where they had fallen onto the conservatory roof. I successfully chloroformed a hedgehog that was entangled in the tennis net, and so managed to release it. I can claim to be useful about the house, and so on and so forth. And now for what I like and don't like. I don't like crowds being jammed up against people, loud voices, noise, protracted talking, parties and especially cocktail parties, cigarette smoke and smoking generally, any kind of drink except in cooking, grey skies, the feet of birds or indeed the feel of a bird altogether, final and fiercest dislike, the taste and smell of hot milk. I like sunshine, apples, almost any kind of music, railway trains, numerical puzzles and anything to do with numbers, going to the sea, bathing and swimming, silence, sleeping, dreaming, eating, the smell of coffee, lilies of the valley, most dogs and going to the theatre. I could make much better lists, much grander sounding, much more important, but there again it wouldn't be me, and I suppose I must resign myself to being me. Then she meets Max Malawan who becomes her future, her second husband, and he's an archaeologist as well. And um, he was a nicer guy. But anyway, they're talking about house hunting and they're here in Delphi in Greece. She says, Delphi was the highlight though. It struck me as so unbelievably beautiful that we went round trying to select a site where we might build a little house one day. We marked out three, I remember. It was a nice dream. I don't know that we believed in it ourselves even at the time. When I went there a year or two ago and saw the great buses travelling up and down and the cafes, the souvenirs and the tourists, how glad I was that we had not built our house there. She talks here about her own attitude towards writing, so she says, My literary activities at this period seem curiously vague in my memory. I don't think even then that I considered myself a bona fide author. I wrote things, yes, books and stories. They were published and I was beginning to accustom myself to the fact that I could count upon them as a definite source of income. But never, when I was filling in a form and came to the line asking for occupation, would it have occurred to me to fill it in with anything but the time-honoured married woman. I was a married woman, that was my status, and that was my occupation. As a sideline, I wrote books. I never approached my writing by dubbing it with the grand name of career. I would have thought it ridiculous. Which is odd because I think she sold more books than any other author. Or she's up there. She's up there in the top ten for sure. She talks about how she never had a place to write and how journalists would say, show me where you write your books. Oh, anywhere. But surely you have a place where you always work. But I hadn't. All I needed was a steady table and a typewriter. I had begun now to write straight onto the typewriter, though I still used to do the beginning chapters and occasionally others in longhand and then type them out. A marble-topped bedroom washstand table made a good place to write. The dining room table between meals was also suitable. She says here, Murder at the Vicarage was published in 1930, but I cannot remember where, when or how I wrote it, why I came to write it, or even what suggested to me that I should select a new character, Miss Marple, to act as the sleuth in the story. 
Certainly at the time I had no intention of continuing her for the rest of my life. I did not know that she was going to become a rival of Hercule Poirot. She talks about writing detective stories as well, so here she says, One of the pleasures of writing detective stories is that there are so many types to choose from. The light-hearted thriller, which is particularly pleasant to do. The intricate detective story with an involved plot which is technically interesting and requires a great deal of work but is always rewarding. And then what I can only describe is the detective story that has a kind of passion behind it. That passion being to help save innocence. Because it is innocence that matters, not guilt. It frightens me that nobody seems to care about the innocent. When you read about a murder case, nobody seems to be horrified by the picture, say, of a fragile old woman in a small cigarette shop, turning away to get a packet of cigarettes for a young thug and being attacked and battered to death. No one seems to care about her terror and her pain and the final merciful unconsciousness. Nobody seems to go through the agony of the victim. They are only, they are only full of pity for the young killer because of his youth. She talks about this chap she knew called Gallagher, she says. He was an extraordinary person, was Gallagher. He told us wonderful tales sometimes. He had a saga about his discovery of a sturgeon on the shores of the Caspian and how he and a friend had managed to bring it, packed with ice, across the mountains and down into Iran to sell it for a large price. It was like listening to the Odyssey or the Aeneid with innumerable adventures that happened on the way. He gave us such useful information as the exact price of a man's life. Iraq is better than Iran, he said. In Iran, it costs you seven pound cash down to kill a man. In Iraq, only three pound. Oh, and then, as if going to Iraq wasn't crazy enough, she went to Syria as well. I suppose it was a different time. And she meets this guy. There was a mention by someone quite casually of Jews. His face changed. Changed in an extraordinary way that I had never noticed on anyone's face before. He said, you do not understand. Our Jews are perhaps different from yours. They are a danger. They should be exterminated. Nothing else will really do but that. I stared at him unbelievingly. He meant it. It was the first time I had come across any hint of what was to come later from Germany. People who had travelled there were, I suppose, already realising it at that time, but for ordinary people in 1932 and 1933, there was a complete lack of foreknowledge. There was this time when they move into a new house and she was convinced she could smell gas and nobody believed her, and then they eventually did isolate something that was causing a gas leak. Uh, and then we have this bit here about the second war, so... And so we were back again in wartime. It was not a war like the last one. One expected it to be, because I suppose one always does expect things to repeat themselves. The first war came with a shock of incomprehension, as something unheard of, impossible, something that had never happened in living memory that would never happen. This war was different. And then when, when the bombs come down, this bomb lands, and uh, this farmer finds it, because it doesn't go off, and the farmer he goes, he kicked it again. It seemed to me it would be much better if he did not kick it, but he obviously wished to show his contempt for all the works of Hitler. Can't even explode properly, he said with disparagement. He says, I became used in the end to raids on London, so much so that I hardly woke up. I would think half drowsily that I heard the siren or bombs not too far away. Oh dear, there they are again, I would mutter and turn over. She basically just didn't bother go to go into bomb shelters. They sell this property as well and uh, she gets like her assistant to help and uh, he says, they said disparaging things about it in front of me, which they shouldn't have done. They said, what hideous decorations, all this flowered wallpaper. I'll soon change that. How extraordinary some people are. Fancy taking that partition wall down. So I thought they'd better be have a lesson and I put up the price 500 pounds. Apparently they'd paid it without qualm. Something more about writing here, it says, it is an odd feeling to have a book growing inside you for perhaps six or seven years, knowing that one day you will write it, knowing that it is building up all the time to what it already is. Yes, it is there already. It just has to come more clearly out of the mist. All the people are there, ready, waiting in the wings, ready to come onto the stage when their cues are called. And then suddenly one gets a clear and sudden command. Now! And uh, uh, someone called Matthew says, there's always hope. And she says, one should adopt something like that, I think, as one's motto in life. It made me mad with anger to hear of one middle-aged couple who had been living in France when the war broke out. When they thought the Germans might be approaching on their march across France, they decided the only thing to be done was to commit suicide, which they did. But the waste, the pity of it, they did no good to anyone by their suicide. They could have lived through a difficult life of enduring, of surviving. Why should, en why should one give up any hope until one is dead? It reminds me of the story that my American godmother used to tell me years and years ago about two frogs who fell into a pail of milk. One said, ooh, I'm drowning, I'm drowning. The other frog said, I'm not going to drown. How can you stop drowning, asked the other frog. Why, I'm going to hustle around and hustle around and hustle around like mad, said the second frog. Next morning, the first frog had given up and drowned, and the second frog, having hustled around all night, was sitting there in the pail right on top of a pat of butter which I think is a nice little moral story. We also have a mention here of Graham Greene, who is one of my favourite authors. 
And I know that Mara from Books Like Woe also likes Graham Greene as well. So it was quite interesting that there was a mention here. She said, Towards the beginning of the war, Graham Greene had written to me and asked if I would like to do propaganda work. I did not think I was the kind of writer who would be any good at propaganda, because I lacked the single-mindedness to see only one side of the case. Nothing could be more ineffectual than a lukewarm propagandist. You want to be able to say X is black as night and feel it. I didn't think I could ever be like that. And then we get to page 525 of this book, right at the end. And obviously we haven't passed a huge amount of time. The, the latter part of her life isn't really covered here, so it's kind of explained here, I guess. But I am writing this in 1965, and that was in 1945. 20 years, but it does not seem like 20 years. The war years do not seem like real years either. They were a nightmare in which reality stopped. For some years afterwards, I was always saying, oh, so-and-so happened five years ago, but each time, really, I ought to have added another five. Now, when I say a few years, I mean quite a lot of years. Time has altered for me, as it does for the old. I think this little bit here is quite interesting. She says, Besides what I've already mentioned, I had written an extra two books during the first years of the war. This was in anticipation of my being killed in the raids, which seemed to be in the highest degree likely as I was working in London. One was for Rosalind, which I wrote first, a book with Hercule Poirot in it, and the other was for Max, with Miss Marple in it. Those two books, when written, were put in the vaults of a bank, and were made over formally by deed of gift to Rosalind and Max. They were, I gather, heavily insured against destruction. Which I just think is interesting that you would even have to have to think like that, it's kind of sad. She talks here a bit more about her, sort of almost a self-deprecation about herself as an author. Let me tilt this down a bit. I haven't quite got my shot back, right, there we go. So she says, It is particularly silly because ordinary social occasions do not make me shy. I do not enjoy big parties, but I can go to them and whatever I feel is not really shyness. I suppose, actually, the feeling is, I don't know whether every author feels it, but I think quite a lot do, that I'm pretending to be something I am not, because even nowadays I do not quite feel as though I am an author. I still have that overlag of feeling that I'm pretending to be an author. Perhaps I'm a little like my grandson, young Matthew, at two years old, coming down the stairs and reassuring himself by saying, this is Matthew coming downstairs. And so I got to the Savoy and said to myself, this is Agatha, pretending to be a successful author, going to her own large party, having to look as though she is someone, having to make a speech that she can't make, having to be something that she's no good at. She talks here about her favourites. She says, of my detective books, I think the two that satisfy me best are Crooked House and Ordeal by Innocence. Rather to my surprise, on rereading them the other day, I find that another one I am really pleased with is The Moving Finger. It is a great test to reread what one has written some 17 or 18 years later. One's view changes. Some do not stand the test of time, others do. And I do, I want to do that with my own books at some point. I probably will reread my own books. And then here she's writing this pretty much ahead of her death, her death and she says, I have looked back at what I wrote then and I am satisfied. I have done what I wanted to do. I have been on a journey, not so much as starting back through the past as a journey forward, starting again at the beginning of it all, going back to the me who was to embark on that journey forward through time. I have not been bounded by time or space. I have been able to linger where I wanted, jump backwards and forwards as I wished. I have remembered, I suppose, what I wanted to remember. Many ridiculous things for no reason that make sense. That is the way we human creatures are made. And now I have reached the age of 75, it seems the right moment to stop because, as far as life is concerned, that is all there is to say. I live now on borrowed time, waiting in the anteroom for the summons that will inevitably come, and then I go on to the next thing, whatever it is. One doesn't luckily have to bother about that. I am ready now to accept death. I have been singularly fortunate. I have with me my husband, my daughter, my grandson, my kind son-in-law, the people who make up my world. I have not yet quite reached the time when I am a complete nuisance to them all. One should be proud of leaving life with that, with dignity and resolution. It's quite a sad ending. And uh, that's I'm going to leave you with that now because I've been filming this for over an hour. Which is the longest I have filmed any individual book review. But I knew it was going to be a long old review, which is why I've been putting off doing this for a few days. Because <laughs> cause I've now got a sore throat. But yeah, that is Agatha Christie's autobiography. I mean, if you've stuck with it all the way to the end, bravo. Salute you there. And um, yeah. I mean, I really enjoyed this book, but I am a massive Agatha Christie fan, which is why I've just been able to film myself talking for an hour non-stop about it. So, rating time, I'm going to give this a 4 out of 5. It wasn't quite a 5, but it was a good book. It was a very well written, obviously. Really, really fascinating, and I'm super glad I read it. And if you are an Agatha Christie fan and you've read more than, say, a dozen of her books, I would definitely recommend checking this out. Otherwise, read some more of her novels first and then get to this. 
there we have it. That's what I thought of Agatha Christie, an autobiography. If you've lasted this far, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought about this book, if you've read it, or about the review. You've basically read it now, because I've just read half of it to you. And uh, yeah, hit that subscribe button for more. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.